Hi everyone, I'm Nico Levo, and today we're going to look at some optional rules that you can use in your D&D game and how to enable those in Roll20. Before we dive in, I'd just like to thank Roll20 for sponsoring this video. So just to be clear, I'm not talking about homebrew or house rules in this video, rather I'm talking about some additional options that are described in Chapter 9 of the Dungeon Master's Guide. And these rules can be great if you've been playing for a long time and you want to spice things up a little bit. So let's take a look at three of them right now. And the first one I want to discuss is called Hero Points. Now mechanically, Hero Points work a lot like Bardic Inspiration in that they allow a player to spend a point to add a d6 to any attack roll, saving throw, or skill check, potentially turning a failure into a success. Level 1 characters start out with 5 hero points, and then when you advance, you lose any hero points you haven't spent yet and gain a new pool of hero points equal to 5 plus half your character level. Players can also spend hero points to turn failed death saves into successes. Now, I realize this won't be for everyone. If you want to run a dark, grim, and gritty campaign, hero points are not going to be for you. But if you're more like me and you prefer to run pulpy games where your player characters are larger than life, then hero points are a great option. You can really turn them from standard adventurers into characters more like John McClane, Indiana Jones, or Lara Croft. One thing I would recommend you do though, if you choose to implement hero points, is have your players role play out or really describe what happens, how the success occurs because of the hero point. So if your player was about to fire a bow shot and they rolled a 16 and the AC for the target is a 17, they add that hero point in there and they make it a success, have them describe what happens. You know, the bow shot goes over the target's shoulder, ricochets off the wall, hits them in the back and they drop to the ground dead. You know, stuff like that will really make things a lot more fun. So let's see how we turn hero points on in Roll20. So what you're going to want to do is go into your character sheet, click on the cog right here, and then scroll down and switch hero points from off to on. And then when you go back to your core page, you'll see we now have a pool of hero points available. If I click on this link right here, that will actually roll the hero point and tell me my value. That hero point was then deducted from my overall pool. And when my character levels up, let's just run through the character mancer real quick here. And we can see that the hero point pool has reset properly to 5 plus half my character's level. My character is now level 2, half of 2 is 1, 5 plus 1 is 6. There we go. So going from larger than life heroes into depths of madness and darkness, we have the second optional rule I want to talk about, which is a sanity score. Now, if you've played games like Call of Cthulhu, you're familiar with sanity and madness mechanics. Essentially, what happens is your player character comes across something that mortals were not meant to know, or they just see something that's so horrific that it risks shattering their mind. That's what sanity is all about in D&D. And if you want to run a campaign, say, in the Domains of Dread, as described in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, then I think this mechanic blends in really nicely. Essentially what happens is your characters will make sanity checks under certain conditions, and you can determine what those conditions are. The DMG does give a handful of examples, so when they come across a piece of text written in an alien language, when they're trying to comprehend alien magic, they can make sanity saving throws, when they make direct contact with the minds of an alien creature, or when they pass into a demiplane built on alien physics. And if they fail those checks, then they risk going mad mad. And the DMG has a couple of tables in Chapter 8 that outline short-term, long-term, and indefinite madness. And these are basically different levels of severity of madness. So depending on what horrific thing your character has encountered, they may be subject to a different madness effect. So you can roll on these tables and see what happens. And I think this makes for some really interesting and exciting role-playing moments as well. So let's say your character has just witnessed an illithid extract somebody's brain and eat it. That's going to call for a sanity check. You roll on it, maybe you get a 50, and now all of a sudden you start babbling and you can't talk anymore because that just shatters your mind. Let's see how we turn it on in Roll20. What you're going to want to do is go to your game's settings page and scroll all the way down to the bottom here 
and select Sanity Score and turn it on. Save your changes. And now when we go back into our game, any new characters that we create will have the sanity score enabled for them. So if I just save changes right now, okay, here's my brand new character. I'm just gonna say that I'll edit the sheet directly. And if you scroll down, you see right underneath charisma, we now have a sanity score. And the DMG includes a couple of methods for how you can set that score. Now that's great for brand new characters, but what about for characters that you already have in your game? For example, my other fighter here does not have a sanity score because his character sheet already existed. Well, what you're going to want to do is go over to the cog tab in the far right, go down to miscellaneous, and click apply default settings. And then we can say here, all right, what do we want to apply? We are going to apply the sanity score, and we'll say apply settings. You'll have a prompt to say, are you sure you want to continue? We'll say okay to that. Then our message says the settings have been successfully applied. Okay, let's go back to our character sheet. And here's Syl again. And now when we go on to their character sheet, we can see they have a sanity score as well. So the last optional rule we'll discuss today is proficiency dice. If you've played D&D 5th edition, you know what a proficiency bonus is. It's a static value that you add to attack rolls, saving throws, and skill checks that you're proficient with. Proficiency dice changes that, so instead of having a static value added to your rolls, you actually roll another die. And which die you roll is determined by what level your character is. So if you're level 1 through 4, instead of getting that plus 2 to all your rolls, you're going to get a 1d4. Instead of a plus 3 at level 5 through 8, you're going to roll a d6 and add that. Now, if you're doing the math, you've probably realized that the higher your character level, the higher the likelihood that they will roll a value lower than just what their straight proficiency bonus would have been. So if we look at levels one through four, you have a 75% chance of rolling a two or higher on a D4. So that means there's a 75% chance you're going to do as well as or better than you would normally do with just a straight plus two proficiency bonus. But then when we get down to level five and it becomes a D6, well now there are two out of those six chances that you're going to roll lower than your straight plus three proficiency bonus would have been. So now you've only got about a 67% chance of doing better. And then when you get down to level nine and that becomes a D8, well now you have a five out of eight chance of rolling the same or better, which is about a 62% chance. So the higher your character level, the technically less proficient you're becoming. So because of that, I think this mechanic works best for low-level one-shots and short low-level campaigns. So if you're going to run a campaign for level one to four characters, or maybe you're going to run just a one-shot for level three characters, go ahead, use proficiency dice because there's a 75% chance they're going to do as good or better than they normally would with their regular proficiency bonus. At higher levels, well, that's up to you. And you may want to talk with your players about that because really when you're getting into higher level play and there's only a 60% chance that they're going to do as good as they normally would with a regular proficiency, yeah, that's probably not something they're going to do, especially because monsters don't use proficiency dice. Only player characters and your important NPCs would. So your average bugbear or goblin or dragon is not going to be subject to the same potential penalties that proficiency dice introduce. So to enable this in your game, what you're going to do is go into your player's character sheet, click on the cog over here, and down in the proficiency bonus section, switch that over to proficiency die DMG. And then when you go back to the core page, you'll see that their proficiency bonus has changed to whatever die is pertinent for their level. So my fighter here is level two, so they have a D4. And now when I make an attack roll, you can see here that my overall roll, if I hover over this, is showing my 13, which is my straight roll, plus three, which is my strength, plus a two, which is the D4 that I rolled for my proficiency. So I've made a couple more rolls here, and you can see now for this crossbow, I rolled a 17, and when I hover over that, I rolled a straight 17, then I have a negative one penalty for my dex, and then I rolled a one for my proficiency die. So I actually evened out to just a 17 there. 
So there you have it, three optional rules that you can use to spice up your D&D games. If you do use these rules in your game, please drop a note in the comments down below because I want to hear how they go for you. And I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please give it a like and consider subscribing. And until next time, folks, have a great day.